Okay, so now we'll continue by normalizing the E prime Y group orbital. So if you recall, when we perform the projection operator method, that generated the function that you see here. And using the same terminology I used on the previous slide, we're just gonna you know, call all of the atomic orbitals um, phi A, phi B, and phi C, because those correspond, remember, to H A, H B, and H C. Um, hydrogen 1s orbitals respectively. So when you um, go through and you need to, let me erase this. So when you go through and wanna normalize that wave function, we, we do exactly the same procedure as we did on the previous page. And as you can kind of see, um, ultimately, all you have to recognize is the terms or the coefficients here are two, one, and one. And ultimately, when um, you come down to the next step where you have to square everything, those are going to now become four, one, and one. And as, as you can really tell without going through all of the details with the integral signs, um, the four, the one, and the one all winds up in here. And then as a result of this, remember you get six uh, C squared is equal to one. And then solving uh, for that, C ends up being one over the square root of six, which obviously is what is here. So that's going to be uh, the normalization constant for the um, E prime Y group orbital in this process. So now what you've what we've what we've accomplished is we've we've normalized now two of the three group orbitals, and that's really important because what you're going to learn is is that because the wave functions have to be normalized, they're also normalized with respect to one another. And that actually gives us a simple path to figuring out what the normalization constant is gonna be for the group orbital that we do not know. So now we come forward with the information we've already established. And then remember that what the concept is going to be is is that everything all three group orbitals um, when combined together also have to be normalized so to use um, this table here at the bottom is gonna is gonna be kind of a simpler exercise so you sort of remember what the what the values were for um, and this should be a1 prime in in this particular case and then that's e prime and that's gonna be prime, they're missing in here. Um, but simply stated, what you're, what you're doing here is, remember the coefficients for A1 prime, in each case, were one over the square root of three. And when you have one over the square root of three, in these cases, what you're, what you're basically doing in, in all of that is the square of them then is one third, one third, and one third. And if you add up those, you basically got the, the normalization. So what you really have is it's the sum of the squares of the coefficients has to equal one. And you've heard that numerous times. And then if you recall, the other, the other one that we did was on the other page, remember we have two thirds, one sixth, and one sixth as the um, coefficient values when they're squared. And then, of course, those add up to one. So now this is the interesting part. So now let's look um, vertically and, and let's kind of take a different approach to this. So I'm going to put this in black. 
But what I want you to recognize is if I, if I add up in these columns now, one third and two thirds, that equals one. And that's really critical. So that tells you all of the weighting of HA went into the first two group orbitals and therefore the sum of those is one, therefore it cannot um, be found in the unknown group orbital E prime X. So that's why when you, when you look at this, that is why there is a zero there. So you can kind of see what we're doing by normalizing the first two wave functions, you can find the coefficient for the unknown wave function because of this, for lack of a better word, um, symmetry in the coefficients that you will determine. Okay, so then if you sort of look at what's left on the, on the, ne in, the next, uh, in the next group here, so if we sort of determine now, what is the sum of one third plus one sixth? Well, remember this is the same as two sixths and one sixth, so that's three sixths. And of course, three sixths is simply stated one half, which is right there. So you see, we, just, we now have determined the unknown coefficient the square of that coefficient from, from knowing this information because when you go down the vertical column, they all have to add up to give you one. And then of course, you're just repeating the same action in this column here, so you sort of know the same thing. Those will together add up to three sixths, and because they add up to three sixths, it, it by default means the, uh, the coefficient um, for HC is going to now be one half. And then I left this out before, but you can kind of see that that's going to be the coefficient for HB. And then um, if they're, if they're, you know, normalized, then when you add across, which is what you're going to do here, um, you'll get that value of one. And this is illustrating the fact that normalization gives you the coefficients um, of, the, of each of the wave functions, but you can actually determine the coefficient of an unknown wave function from the other two when you have a group of, of three of them like we do here. And that's gonna be very easy to, to take advantage of. So let me clear my markings and then I have this summarized here a little bit better. So what you're really looking at here is, is that if you look at the contributions, again, this is, this is the contributions from HA, um, two thirds goes into into e y prime, one third goes into into a prime, and that means zero uh, character of uh, h a is found in the third wave function or in the third group orbital. Um, similarly, um, because we were dealing with the squares here, we sort of know that then the roots are the thing that we're going to have to deal with in terms of what is the actual coefficient for the last wave function. So let me just clear that and just give you the summary that very clearly the, um, the coefficient on the E prime X group orbital um, has to now be one over the square root of two and given you effectively, you know, B um, or phi B or phi B minus phi C. So now what's the shape gonna be? Well, we sort of know it's gonna have B minus C. So let's just do it that way. So that is, you know, HB minus HC. That is, the, that is what the group orbital will look like. And now that we have the symmetries and the wave functions of, of all of these 1S group orbitals, as well as their magnitudes, now we can actually go to the final steps for constructing the MO diagram. Uh, but before we move forward, let's just remember that the phasing in this particular case is when I have the circles filled in, 
their positive phase. And when I have open circles, those are going to be negative phase. And as you can kind of see there, that is um, positive phase on the left and negative phase on the right. But that's not going to be anything to worry about because all, all that means is, is that it's going to it's going to have an in phase um, interaction um, with the negative of the px orbital on boron, and then the positive the 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 sum uh, the positive sum is simply going to be the antibonding interaction. So everything here is is really consistent, and again, you can kind of see here that. All of that lies along X, so that that has X axis symmetry.